Good morning. Today is March 1st, and this is the House Energy and Environment Committee. Uh, today, we will be hearing from Secretary Moore and others on the governor's proposed 2024 budget. Welcome, Secretary Moore. Uh, we are hoping today to hear from you about water broadly. Yep. Um, ask questions, members, about water broadly. Uh, and uh, we will be hearing from others uh, as well. So, Secretary Moore. Great. Uh, thank you very much for having me this morning. For the record, I am Julie Moore. I uh, am going to start with just a, a set of slides um, that hopefully. Is playing there. Uh, provide a, a high level overview of um, clean, our clean work under the Clean Water Fund in general. Um, but then I'm also very happy to answer other questions you might have. I'm joined this morning by Eric Blatt, um, who's our director of engineering and our expert in the state revolving fund, um, both clean water and drinking water state revolving funds. And so to the extent uh, any of the questions you have go beyond, <laughs> go into detail around our state revolving fund programs, uh, Eric is, is prepared to answer your questions. Um, so just talking a little bit about the, the Clean Water Initiative, making sure folks have a sense of the, the history and the legal requirements we're working in. Uh, there's a fairly complicated funding portfolio that um, supports our clean water work at this point. Uh, the role of the Clean Water Board in prioritizing uh, the, the budget that we is included in the governor's recommend. And then a little bit of information about our capital bill request, recognizing it's outside the um, or it's separate from the appropriation, but at the same time, part of our uh, funding stew. I always like to start with a reminder that Vermont has some pretty spectacular water bodies. Uh, my favorite part of this set, oops, geez, my computer is touchy this morning. My, uh, my favorite set of part of this set of photos is that they are almost, I think with one exception, uh, taken by staff in the course of their work. So we get to look at and sample and um, work to steward some pretty incredible water bodies. Um, but we also know that human actions on the land um, can harm our waters. Most of the water pollution that we are working to address at ANR um, is associated with precipitation driven events. Uh, so rainfall and snow melt coming off of farm fields, roads um, and paved or impervious surfaces. The Clean Water Initiative dates back uh, to the, the early 2000s um, and was initially focused on efforts to address water quality concerns in Lake Champlain. The types of water quality concerns we are experiencing in Vermont, which are um, probably whose, whose most notable presentation is a blue-green algae bloom as shown in the photo um, on the slide. These aren't unique to Vermont. Uh, nutrient problems exist in many freshwater lakes. Uh, we This summer we'll be participating in EPA's um, next national lake assessment, but the one that there's most recently information available from was in 2017. And it found that about 20% of the nation's lakes had high levels of nutrients. Um, and some of the most notable examples are Lake Pepin in Minnesota, which is the headwaters to the Mississippi River. Um, as well as Lake Erie in Western New York. Um, Vermont's response compared to other states, I would say is, is good in that we have uh, regulatory programs that exceed federal minimums, particularly around stormwater management and agricultural stewardship. And we have committed resources, which is the Clean Water Fund. We have pollution budgets for a number of the major water bodies in Vermont. Uh, Lake Champlain is perhaps the best, most well-known, um, and there's a phosphorus TMDL or total maximum daily load. Uh, similarly, there are phosphorus TMDLs for Lake Memphremagog and Lake Carmi, and we participate in a multi-state TMDL <coughs> around the Long Island Sound. Um, because it is a saltwater body, we are, nitrogen tends to be the a limiting nutrient that determines water quality. Um, and so we are focused on reducing nitrogen pollution in the Eastern half of Vermont. Um, many of the commitments made in these TMDLs were also codified in state law, either in Act 64 of 2015, which is sometimes referred to as Vermont's Clean Water Act or Act 76 of 2019. 
And broadly, uh, the clean water funding provided to the agency is used to, to restore water quality in impaired bodies that don't meet our water quality standards, as well as undertake projects to protect high, water, high quality water bodies and keep them from becoming impaired. So it is a, a mix of different funding sources um, that we use for clean water work. Uh, federal dollars play an important role, as does state funding. Um, generally, most of our programs also expect cost share, uh, either from the local municipality or the private landowner. And currently, uh, state funding is averaging on the higher end of that 50 to $60 million a year range. I'll talk a little bit more about the sources of that funding, um, but one of them is tied to the property transfer tax, which has overperformed uh, for several years now compared to recent history. So the, the proposed funding in the governor's budget for clean water work for FY24 is just above $62 million. Um, a little less than half of that, uh, $25 million is, comes from the clean water fund, um, which is the aggregate of a 2% surcharge on the property or 0.2% surcharge, excuse me, on the property transfer tax, the sheets, which are the unclaimed bottle deposits, and 6% of the rooms and meals tax. Uh, in addition, we have some one-time money available for clean water work this year. Uh, that includes a $10 million ARPA appropriation, as well as what I've termed an excess receipt from FY22. And that um, is where the property transfer tax specifically well outperformed uh, the estimate that we were provided by the tax department back in FY21. Uh, the capital bill recommendation includes almost $16 million for clean water, um, 5.89 that would come directly from the capital fund, as well as a $10 million allocation one time GF to cash fund uh, with that's being uh, proposed through the capital budget. And then we also have been the uh, beneficiaries of some uh, good work by Senator Leahy at the federal level. Uh, to secure funding that, that flows to the agency through the Lake Champlain Basin Program um, to the tune of about $6 million a year. What's not included on this list is work that's funded through the T-Bill. Uh, VTrans has what we call a TS4, or tra Transportation Separate Storm Sewer Permit uh, from, the, from the agency to address runoff from state highways. Um, it's difficult to, to tease those numbers out of the work VTrans is, is doing relative to the road network. So just know that it's it's not part of what's presented here. That would be in, in addition to the $62 million um, shown on the slide. How is that money raised? So uh, it, it, the same way I think most of their federal funds are. So for new construction projects, I believe it's a four to one match. They need one state dollar for every four federal dollars. When it comes to the operation and maintenance of stormwater practices within the highway system, it is the cost is fully borne by the state. Thank you. So it just it, it depends if they're building a new stormwater practice or maintaining an existing one. Can you say that again then? So it's four to one match, federal four, State one. one. If they're building new stormwater practices. So um, anyone who's driven north on 89 last summer, there was a lot of work taking place in the median up by St. Albans. Those were new stormwater management projects that VTrans was installing as part of their commitments under the Lake Champlain TMDL. The construction of those is eligible for that four to one funding. When they need to maintain them every several years to clean out sediment and other debris that accumulates, that is 100% state funding required to do that maintenance. Representative Smith and Pat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vivian Sloan. Uh, do any of these funds uh, go towards uh, Eurasian milfoil? They do not. The, the, our aquatic invasive species work is separate. <laughs> From our clean water work. Is there still funding for that this year? There is. There is. I've heard not. But. No, there there is some funding. Um, there are sort of two pieces in motion currently. One is, um, as this members, long term members of this committee may, may recall, we were uh, drawing down some one time monies in our aquatic nuisance control account as a result of um, an infusion of funds we received several years ago from the Army Corps. 
We exhausted those in the FY23 budget, so it, it does appear that there's a reduction, but essentially we've returned to base funding levels for our aquatic nuisance control work. Um, in addition, we've received an inquiry from the U.S. Coast Guard about uh, with some concerns they have about using motorboat registration fees, which is how we accrue those base funds um, that we are working through currently um, and, and hope to see that resolved. But there, there's questions being asked. It hasn't changed our funding formula yet. Thank you. Representative Pat, then Stephen. The uh, performance or overperformance of the uh, property transfer tax, is that, is that related to what's happened to property values? It is. Okay, so correct. That, that could change going Correct. Historically, we had averaged this, this um, two tenths of a percent surcharge had averaged, I think, five to six million dollars a year. Um, over the last two years, it's been above ten million dollars a year. Representative Stebbins. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So you, you said that the uh, aquatic invasive species work has returned to base funding. What is that base funding? Is it enough? How are, how are we doing? We're hearing a lot from people about aquatic invasive species. Um, and last year, I do recall, or two years ago, Representative Smith and I were sitting on House Transportation when we changed um, the decal uh, requirements for boats. So, like, we actually helped to reduce that funding in a way. Um, so, just curious, what is that base funding? Is it enough? How many staff do we have? Is it working? So I may have to get back to you on some of those questions or uh, suggest that you hear from Oliver Pearson, who's the manager of our lakes program, who can who um, and his team manages that work specifically. Uh, I believe our budget for that work is is to the tune of about four hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, we with more than half of that amount going out in the form of grants. Uh, they tend to be fairly modest grants that are usually matched um, by either the local municipality or a lake watershed association. Um, there is additional funding available uh, in the Champlain Basin portion of the state through the Lake Champlain Basin program um, that generally sponsors a number of what we refer to as greeter programs. Um, so staff at fishing access areas that are helping remind boaters about invasive species transport, um, as well as more recently, we've piloted um, a, in partnership between the Fish and Wildlife Department, the Environmental Conservation Department, and the Basin Program, uh, a wash station at the Mallets Bay um, fishing access area, uh, knowing that that's one of our, our most popular fishing access. Um, but I can I will provide some additional information in writing, but also encourage you to hear from Oliver Pearson about that program. Joe. That'd be great. Can I, can I ask a couple of follow-ups? Um, so 400 k for the program, half of which goes out to grants. So that sounds like one, two FTEs. How many FTEs? Two, I believe it's two FTEs. And has it always only been two, or has it been more in the past? I will need to get back to you on that too. I, I'm not, it's it's not individual. There's one full-time staff person that that's all they do. And then there are other people who it's a portion of their work. And yeah. so it's, it's. I wanna make sure I get you the right, I wanna make sure I get you the right answer. And, and if you could also, if you don't mind, um, I don't know if you can tell this is my budget area that I have to cover. <laughs> if you don't mind, um, you know, how, what was that in past years? Just yep. so we can get a sense of, um, whether or not we're really looking at this appropriately, given the fact, as your photo said at the beginning, just, just how critical our water resources are for tourism, for economic development, and for quality of life. Um, I, I, there were, uh, I think we had the Lake Champlain folks, people in here, and they were talking about a lake-wise program, um, and they thought uh, they were highlighting some of the programs that work. Should I ask Oliver Pearson about that program or? Yeah, that's also within his shop. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Smith. Thank you. I'd like to go along with what Representative Stubborn was just talking about. And that you were you said that $400,000 is for uh, aquatic nuisances. What can we do about raising that? Uh, right now, we've got two lakes in Derby. We get either ten or $15,000 from the state. And the town matches it, I believe. Uh, what can we do about raising that level, that four hundred thousand dollar level? So, 
It's a tough time to answer that question. And I will give you several components to what I see as, as things that are in, in play or in motion right now. One is, is this work with the Coast Guard. And I think we, we need to get that resolved. We may end up having to pull all of this work outside of our motor boat registration fees in order to address their concerns. Um, we don't know yet know the answer to that. Uh, one of the other pieces is um, the number of applicants for our aquatic <laughs> invasive grant program um, has grown significantly over time. And so while the budget has remained fixed, we see more and more folks uh, seeking to access that pot of money. Uh, in general, I think that that's a, a good thing, um, but certainly it causes the amount of the grants we're able to offer to reduce. Um, I would also flag the clean water, this was raised to the clean water board and whether there's a role for clean water fund funding to help address aquatic invasive species. Um, and that is something we agreed as a board that we would take up at our, our next meeting based on the public comments provided at the last meeting. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces right now. Certainly the, the sticker program you looked at previously is one suggestion for a way to enhance funding for aquatic invasive species control work. Um, we tried, piloted a voluntary program maybe 15 years ago um, and that I would offer that that didn't work. It was administratively cumbersome and did not generate significant resources. Um, beyond that, I, we don't have specific proposals on the table um, to address aquatic invasive species at this time. The reason I ask that, <laughs> I'll be brief, uh, <clears throat> Lake Salem has found more uh, milfoil in their lake, and the Salem Association came to our select board and asked for three hundred and twenty-five dollars or $30,000 of our ARPA money, which we gave them $75,000 of. Uh, they don't know if what they're going to try to do is going to work or not without getting this kind of money. So it's a $300,000 gas is what they were working at. And I'd much rather see them use state money than town money. Right. So, I, and I, these are complex, tend to be very complicated projects. I suspect many of you have heard about some of the concerns that have been expressed around Lake Bomazine oh, and yeah. trying to balance recreational access, management of invasive species, and some of the habitat benefits that even aquatic or invasive plants provide. It's complicated. Um, although we all, I think there's broad agreement, our best approach is to try to keep aquatic invasive species from being introduced into new lakes in the first place. And that's where that greeter program really comes in. Um, and I think when you hear from Oliver, you'll hear that's also why we prioritize those initiatives for fun. So he's the go-to guy that you will be hearing from. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Stebbins. We heard uh, from the Vermont Association of Conservation Districts, mm -hmm. um, and it seems like they're doing quite a bit of um, work <clears throat> to try and help local groups with aquatic invasive species. Um, control, I mean, uh, based off of their testimony, the handout that they gave us, they asked for a, a reasonably sized budget line item. And I guess my question is, if you had more staff able, I guess my question is, uh, given the staff that you have to address aquatic invasive species issues, um, how critical is this entity to actually sort of fill in the holes that perhaps a &R would be doing if you had the staff? I, honestly, I don't know the answer to that question. I wasn't aware that the Association of Conservation Districts was um, a significant component of our work around aquatic invasive species. If well, it's around water quality writ large. Correct. Around water quality, absolutely. They are an important partner in working with agricultural producers in riparian area plantings. Um, they also depend, and some of the conservation districts do a lot of work <clears throat> around stormwater, but I'm not sure um, that they have a significant role when it comes to aquatic invasive species management. If they do, that would be relatively new because I'm not aware of it. I guess more, I mean, um, Bit large. Oh, okay. If we're, having, if, if we're seeing that perhaps we're not having enough, if we're seeing perhaps, you know, only one person on a particular program, are we having to support other programs in which case, 
because we don't have the a &R staff to do it. So um, backing up or pulling up maybe from aquatic invasive species to talk about our clean water work more generally. Uh, this is this is a dynamic area right now. Um, coming out of Act 76 of 2019, we created what are called clean water service providers. And those are entities that are focused on supporting implementation of non-regulatory programs. And I think that there's an important distinction to be made there. I would offer uh, the agency has the capacity within our regulatory program. So stormwater management, wastewater treatment, um, maybe being chief among them when it comes to, to the clean water set of equations. But um, the outreach and direct engagement with individual landowners around non-regulatory programs um, was a place that we recognized a gap. And it's a gap that's intended to be filled by clean water service providers. In some parts of the state, uh, conservation districts are part of the are part of the clean water service provider. Probably the best example is the Pulteney Meadowy Conservation District is partnered with the Rutland RPC. Um, in other parts of the state, um, there are other entities that have, have stepped up um, to become clean water service providers. Uh, I would say we're, we're still in the early days. Uh, clean water service providers really sort of took effect uh, late last year. And so I would withhold judgment on what additional capacity is needed in that space. But I, I think in general, uh, we also saw that need um, worked with the General Assembly several years ago and are on our way to what I hope is a solution to addressing that gap. And how much money is, is going to the clean water service providers? It depends. Um, it's scaled to the, the reduction requirement um, in the basin that they are serving, but I believe the minimum allocation is about a half a million dollars to each provider a year, recognizing that there's some fixed overhead and administrative costs, but some of them receive significantly more than that. We have a funding formula. Thank you. We will probably want to hear more about those, and that doesn't have to be today. But yeah, Neil Common would be the person who could. He's sort of the uh, the, the champion of the clean water service providers within the agency, and was intimately involved in the design of that program. Representative Tory. Oh, yes. I have a question about the clean water zone. Mm -hmm. Is this a good time to ask you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so 25 million is in the fiscal year 2400? Yes. I was wondering how that compares with the year. So <laughs> I have this great handout that I'll pass around because I have an excruciatingly small table in my presentation. <laughs> Appreciating the font on this is not great for all eyes, um, but <laughs> it's as big as I was able to make it. Um, so I just, before I, before I jump to that, just want to be clear, and I think I said this in my remarks, that the, the, the appropriation and the T-bill money is sort of outside what we talk about at the Clean Water Board. So this budget table you see in front of you, which I also have on the screen, <laughs> Uh, reflects the overall clean water budget. Um, and I actually have a, let's see if this, this is just FY24. I apologize. Let me bring up. Um, so this, this spreadsheet is minus VTRANS, everything right. we're spending in state on money, including the federal <clears throat> Leahy money. It does not include the Leahy money. <laughs> it was, it was, if you, oh, sorry. It is what it is what's shown in this red box or what I grabbed together in this red box. Okay. And then the outside voice. Okay, this is great. So this slide says six million federal dollars, and then it would whatever V Trans has, we don't know, but is Correct. separate. Got it. Correct. And that would be the universe of water. Correct. Of our clean clean water work. So we also prepare each year a clean water investment report that looks retrospectively. Um, now back to 2017 and lays out all of the investments that have been made, um, both at the state level, as well as by major watersheds. So you could look at projects just within the Winooski River watershed or just within uh, the Batten River watershed. Um, so that, that information exists and happy to talk and to, um, have Emily Bird give a presentation on, on the most current version of the report, which came into the um, General Assembly in January. 
Uh, and I just, while I'm on a really big question, I had a constituent say, ask me this question, you know, and I was like, I wonder where the clearinghouse is for kind of even just this slide. Like, where was it? Where does the citizen go to understand what we're spending on water quality? So uh, the place to go. This thing. Let's see if I can get back to the right page for you. So we have a, a water investment. Um, if they search Vermont Clean Water Board, we have this page uh, dedicated to the Clean Water Board, but it includes all of the information on the budget process, um, as well as an ability then to link to the, the reports um, from the Clean Water Initiative, uh, which is that annual summary. Representative Stemmons. Thanks, Richard. But if we go to the Vermont Clean Water Board, it does not show the T bill money. Correct. That is outside the consideration of the Clean Water Board. What is that normally, generally, like roughly? Oh, sorry, range? Um, let's see. <laughs> Just so I have a. I mean, I, I, well, I, go I think we would, uh, you'd have to talk to, to D trans to have an answer to that. I don't want to hazard, Michelle. hazard a guess. Yeah. Michelle or Craig DG Marino is the, um, their lead with the clean water <laughs> reporting. Thank you. I wanted to find, we have an operating statement that's also here. Um, and I think this gets at the question about the last several years, um, or at least the 23 and 24. So you can see how uh, the, the different um, components of revenue into the Clean Water Fund performed, which is the Ashits has uh, been running really right about this $3 million, the unclaimed bottle deposits, the property um, transfer tax surcharge, as I said, had been about 10 million over the last several years. And then the rooms and meals tax has been in this 13 to $14 million range. Oh, you're not seeing that. Shoot. <laughs> I thought I was sharing my, no. sorry. I'll, I will send a link to the operating statement. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> you all were very polite and nodding at my, <laughs> as I'm <laughs> talking about things you can't see. I'll send a link to the operating statement, uh, the investment report, and also um, the sort of the clean water webpage. Representative Smith and Tory. Thank you. If this isn't the right time to ask this, please stop me. Uh, I'm looking on here. You have Lakes and Crisis Fund. Mm -hmm. There are four, I believe there are four criteria for a lake to be considered Lake and Crisis. Correct. Right. Is it still the same this year? Because right now, the only thing holding back from Lake Men from Agog becoming that is real estate Correct. part of it. Correct. Is there any way around that? Or is there any are established in statute, so I yeah. think it would require the legislature to make a change. Not okay. from my my not on my end. I guess this would be the answer. All right, thank you. Representative, mm -hmm. <coughs> just to follow up to that um, retrospective report. Is there a separate report that gives you a sense of how what the impact of those investments was? Like, how are we doing on it? The investment report contains that it does. I would I would encourage you to hear from Emily Bird. It's really a, a very thoughtful and informative <clears throat> report that her team puts together each year. And so, just to to talk briefly about what's shown on the the eleven by seventeen sheet I passed around is it gives you a sense of where the money from the Clean Water Fund flows into the different agencies of state government. So ANR, um, the Agriculture Agency, VTRANS, ACCD, and the Agency of Administration each receive um, a, a portion, a greater or lesser portion of the, the total funding available through the Clean Water Fund. In case you're curious, the Agency of Administration um, is responsible for stormwater utility payments. We make a payment to any community that establishes a stormwater utility of $25,000 a year uh, for the first five years of its existence. Um, 
And then uh, as well as there is money that flows to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board for a couple of their agriculturally related initiatives um, that's also tracked as part of our clean water budget. The VTRANS components shown here are really passed through, not work being done on the state highway system, but rather VTRANS uh, administers uh, the municipal grant and aid program and the local roads program, both of which are uh, to support municipalities in implementing the municipal roads general permit that was required as part of Act 64. So maybe I'll just jump ahead a little bit to the um, talk briefly about the, the capital bill. So section 10 of the capital bill um, also relates to, to clean water and it is indicated um, in one of the, the columns on the, the sheet I passed around the, the third column um, over is the, the board recommended capital bill. And you'll notice that there is a, a change in what the, between that and what the governor recommends. Um, which I will speak to in, in just a second. Uh, I flagged the, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, which is what we use to make improvements to wastewater facilities, as well as municipal pollution control grants, which help make those uh, clean water loans more affordable. And again, Eric is here if you have questions uh, specific to those. Um, but in addition, there are water quality grants to farmers through the Ag Agency that are part of the capital bill appropriation, uh, work on our own forestry access roads uh, that also um, that are owned and managed by the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And then each year we include, a well, each first year of the biennium, we include a placeholder for FY25. Um, and so there is a $10 million placeholder in the capital budget. And that's just because the, the Clean Water Board budgets annually, and obviously the capital bill is a, a two-year appropriation. <clears throat> So just in terms of how the, those break out, uh, it's a little more than $2 million that's going to the Ag Agency, um, about $2.8 million to VHCB. Again, these are both for uh, agricultural water quality projects. There's $550,000 going for forest access road water quality improvements, and then that $10 million um, placeholder for, 20, for FY25. Um, not shown here, and I must have left that slide off, my apologies, is uh, there are two um, rather significant recommendations in terms of, of one-time cash capital fund. Um, there's a $27 million um, reserve that's proposed in the governor's recommended budget that allows us to take full advantage of the bipartisan infrastructure law increases in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and Drinking Water State Revolving Fund um, between now and FY27. And then there's a $10 million uh, recommendation that would increase the amount available for municipal pollution control grants to allow us to make sure um, that those wastewater projects remain affordable for municipalities. What was that number? If there's $10 million for municipal pollution control grants, and then a total of $27 million uh, in reserve funds to, which is the state match to the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, we should be able to act with those $27 million, we will be able to access uh, approximately $320 million in federal funding. That's general fund, the $27 million. It's one, yeah, one-time monies. 320 million leverage. Um, Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I believe I remember reading that ANR identified $2 million in backlog um, water infrastructure Correct. work, um, but the number I've seen is like 219 million to actually. Uh, uh, address some of those. So I guess my question is, do you feel like, are we sending, are, are we actually able to, are we sending any of the potential federal dollars we could be using through ARPA or whatnot back to the feds because we do not have the capacity to actually capitalize upon them given the gap of 2 billion and 219? 
No, no. Um, so the, the $2 billion in need is, is sort of an estimate over what the required investment is or sh is likely to be over the next 10 years. Um, the, assuming uh, that we have the match to access all of the money available to us through the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, coupled with the significant ARPA commitments that have been made to water infrastructure, as well as what we describe as our, our base appropriations through the state revolving fund, um, we are on track over the next three to four years to sort of keep up with the rate of spend that's required to, to address that $2 billion worth of need. Not all of that money comes from the state. Uh, some of it comes from communities and is paid back by rate payers in paying their water and sewer bills. Um, so it's, again, that, that mix of funding where there's a federal component, a state match component, as well as a local component. So that's great that we're keeping up with the potential rate of like spend in terms of really leveraging all of the dollars possible. Do we have a plan for like that $2 billion over 10 years? I mean, how do we, I, I don't feel like when I look at half a, half a million a year, um, and I know it doesn't include the T-bill or the late six million, but that's a big, and I know it's only one year over 10. But I mean, <clears throat> infrastructure, the more that you delay improving it and investing it, the worse it gets. Correct. Do, do we have a, does A&R have a plan of like how we're going to address that, like updating fees or um, looking at alternative additional revenue opportunities, because it's just going to get worse if we have such a big. To be, yeah. to be clear, most of the infrastructure is not state owned. These are locally owned drinking water systems and wastewater collection and treatment systems. What the state provides through our revolving fund programs is access to low cost capital, uh, as well as often an amount of loan forgiveness to help make those projects affordable. Um, these are revolving funds, and Eric is probably in a better position than I am to talk about the balances in those funds, but the, uh, the way they work is the $27 million, for example, capitalizes a grant we take down from EPA. We then loan it out, forgive a portion of it, but then the community over time is paying back into that revolving fund, which allows us to turn around um, and issue additional loans. I don't... I'll go, Eric. I'm going to act for the record. I'm glad that, uh, um, no, that's an accurate characterization of the fund. Uh, right now, on the clean water side, we're revolving about $10 million a year. Drinking water side, which is parallel funding source, uh, we're revolving about $6 million a year. So, just uh, for context, uh, the clean water SRF started up in the late 80s. It, um, was preceded by a federal construction grants program and uh, transitioned to low. And uh, 10 years later, drinking water started up as a state revolving fund. And uh, so primarily sourced with federal dollars. The matching rate historically has been 20% state to, to the federal dollars. Uh, with the uh, recent infrastructure law, the first two years, it's the five-year period of funding from the Fed. This is supplemental to the, to the base dollars that we've been getting annually through the two SRF programs. Uh, the first two years of this five-year period, the match rate is 10%. And the remaining three years jumps up to 20%. And by when you say revolving, that's the amount that's getting paid back in right. each year, in addition to new capitalization. So we have roughly twenty million dollars right. on the so clean water side. For twenty-four round numbers, um, about thirty-six million between the base monies that we're getting on the clean water side, the, the supplemental funds that we're receiving through the IIJA law, the state match that's going into the fund. And then on top of that is the 10 million that uh, Secretary Moore mentioned for pollution control grants. Now those funds don't go into the SRF fund, but they are supplemental funds to the same projects that qualify for these loans. And also, uh, again, as Secretary Moore mentioned, uh, with the IIJ 
a lot. There's a substantial amount of forgiveness that's providing probably half of the funds, uh, the federal funds. Are right. forgiven. And um, thank you for that. Do you have a, is there like a place for one pager on the on this that we could? <laughs> um, I realize that's. Maybe. We can provide the committee with kind of a nice summary that shows the progression over the five year period of the federal dollars. Um, and if the committee is interested in drinking water as well, I bet then one, one sheet. Well, I do also think that it's important. Um, we've taken a lot of testimony over the years in this committee on our municipal water supplies and how much they are, it's probably fair to say, in arrears on maintenance and need. They have, there's a great need there in probably every one of our communities for smaller water systems in particular. <laughs> Could you speak to that just briefly? Right. So the both SRF programs are designed for construction improvements. That includes the planning necessary to advance project to construction. These funds aren't used for maintenance. Oh. So operation and maintenance is oh. not an area that... Uh, to be covered. However, on the drinking water side, a substantial amount of these grants goes towards what are referred to as set asides. And those set asides are used to fund a variety of activities that are designed to assist the public water system. So I think I just got a little confused. On the drinking water side, within the state revolving loan fund, <coughs> set asides oh, that's correct. that are available for maintenance. Not maintenance per se, but assistance to support the training, for example, of the operators. We're actually required to have a program in place that offers training to <coughs> operators of public water systems. Uh, yeah. Also, with that same set aside, we have been supporting the municipalities in developing asset management programs so that they um, are able to better understand. Uh, the condition of all of their pipes and pumps, um, and then build a plan to ensure uh, their long-term investment needs are being met. And so what are we doing as a state to help with maintenance of existing systems? No, that is a, a local yeah. loss yeah. and covered by the ratepayers. And there's no... I, I, whatever, all this federal dollars that we're trying to match available. <laughs> Those dollars generally are held to the same construct as our state revolving fund program. So they're really there for, for capital or construction related investments. For new water systems. Or refurbishment and replacement of existing systems, but not the maintenance of them. So when you have to actually... Refurbishment versus maintenance. Refurbishment would mean you have a... a clarifier tank at a wastewater facility that's reached the end of its useful life and has to be replaced outright. Or what about water lines that need replacement outright? Those, those also are considered a capital expense. What's not considered okay. a capital expense would be line cleaning or... Um, oh, I see. Okay, good. That makes me feel much better because I was thinking... Addressing roof that. control, like okay. other maintenance needs within the system. Terminology... Uh, Yes, that helps. <laughs> Representative Sibelius. So slightly adjacent to this, I have a question um, which will not be a surprise around training, uh, staff training funds. So as we see water quality regulations, you know, really dynamic atmosphere, um, rapidly changing with funds coming in and out. Um, where would we see, not in the Clean Water Board, obviously, um, budget, but where would we see what type of funding is available or budgeted for for DEC training on those programs? Uh, in this question, so uh, this is DEC staff specifically. Yes. Yeah, um, I will need to get back to you, but I know that that is something Commissioner Beeling is looking at pulling together for you as well. Great. So, speaking of staff, um, I'm curious how much. Staffing is supported by the water quality funds, both at ANR and at AAFM. So I will let me get back to you on that. So there are direct positions at the agriculture agency that are supported um, by the, the clean water budget. Uh, there are a number of positions within ANR that um, <clears throat> were administrative costs of so staff costs are considered part of the line item. Um, 
that I would need to, and that that's not just within DEC, uh, our fish and wildlife department, as well as FPR also have some amount of staff time that's charged to the clean water fund. And I can get that information for you. Yeah. And then uh, I guess if it would have a summary of like, so why would be help, you know, I mean, like what was drawn to our attention that there's a limited position forester position at our EFR. So what is that? How is that related to the clean water TMDLs and all that work that we're trying to do? Sure. I mean, I can speak to that a little bit. So um, there's there are a couple of unique initiatives, the forest roads piece and the uh, the wild the wetland restoration conservation and restoration initiative are two um, where departments of the agency are directly implementing um, projects on state owned lands. And so unlike in much of the work done by DEC, where we might issue either a grant or contract with a clean water service provider, a consulting engineer, or a, a watershed association to support some of the projects, these are projects that are internal to, to state government. So in FPR, um, as you may know, we uh, own about 600 miles of forest roads. Uh, those are used both for silvicultural <clears throat> operations, but also for recre outdoor recreation purposes. Um, and we are holding ourselves, as I would hope would be <laughs> self-evident, to the same standards we're asking municipalities to hold themselves to in terms of managing runoff from the road infrastructure we own and operate. Um, so the money in FPR for forest roads, as well as that staff position, is essentially to, to pay for uh, or to cover the costs associated with uh, holding ourselves to the MRGP standards. Similarly, in fish and wildlife, they are running an extensive wetland uh, conservation and restoration initiative, uh, um, which is part of the um, natural area component of how we're gonna achieve our TMDL goals. Uh, these wetlands are being added to existing wildlife management areas generally. And so again, it, it's state-owned land uh, that we're then engaging in wetland restoration opportunities around. Um, and so it, it doesn't necessarily make sense to contract with a partner in either of those instances to provide the, the capacity for that work since it's actually work being done on state lands. And are those new positions? As of as of the the the, for, the forest road one is, and that we just completed or in the process of completing the the inventory, similar to how municipalities were asked to complete a road erosion inventory, we uh, adapted that tool for use on our forest roads and are in the process this year of completing that inventory. So this would be new work to start the implementation component. Uh, the wetlands work has been, I think, this is either our third or fourth year. Um, of uh, pursuing that wetlands work. It was initially funded exclusively with federal, some of the federal funding um, from Senator Leahy, but we have expanded it to include some funding from the Clean Water Fund as well, um, given the success of the initiative. And, but it was a new position three or four years ago to do that work. Correct. Do other members have further questions? Representative Stevens. Um, are you the right person to ask about how it's not on clean water funds, but it's like we also get a lot of emails about PFAS in groundwater. And I think that's more the environmental contingency fund. Are, are you the right person to sort of ask about? So you can ask the question and I it, it's certainly within the agency. And if I can't answer it, I can give an answer for you or identify the person who could provide it. Um, so I guess my question is, how is that fund doing? Because my understanding is we haven't really touched it since the 1980s and is the ECF. It, yeah, correct. So the Environmental Contingency Fund, um, the, the only ongoing appropriation to the Environmental Contingency Fund is related to the hazardous waste transfer tax. Um, and there's a bit of us being a victim of our own success in that we have dramatically reduced the amount of hazardous waste being generated and transported in Vermont. Um, but it also means then the revenue into the ECF on an ongoing basis has also um, declined dramatically over that period of time. I believe it now averages between two and three hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, that said, over, during my tenure, so over the last six years, there have been a number of one-time appropriate, significant one-time appropriations made to the ECF. 
Uh, these include VW settlement funds, I think about five years ago now, um, as well as um, one-time money in each of the last two years' budgets for specific initiatives. One, um, about four and a half million dollars to support PCB testing in schools that we're currently engaged in. And then the $3 million that was included in the budget, this year's Budget Adjustment Act, along with an additional $10 million proposal in the governor's recommend um, to support work related to, to PFAS. So I'm glad we're figuring out how to fill that hole. And that's a great success. But do we, I mean, um, it's not like all these. Uh, it's not like PFAS and groundwater is going away. Um, do we have sort of a plan for how, besides like, yes, we have VWW settlement dollars, let's apply it here. Do we have a plan of like where we might get those funds or like? Of, I believe we submitted a report to the General Assembly and I will try to, to find a copy of it four or five years ago with a set of options. Um, for providing a more sustainable ongoing source of funding to the ECF. And I can um, provide you with a copy. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. More nighttime reading. I do have one more question. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Switching gears to total maximum daily loads, are we, how are we doing reaching like our, our or getting under? Um, that number and, and uh, <clears throat> basically complying with what those standards are? So uh, we are making progress. Uh, again, I would encourage you to hear from Emily Bird and yeah. she can speak to this in detail. Uh, these are 20 year initiatives. So the Lake Champlain program um, kicked off in 2016. So we are on a path towards 2036. Um, I would say we are probably at this point a, a little bit behind if you drew a straight line from 2016 to 2036. Um, but the fact of the matter is we've sort of expected those reductions to occur as a curve. Um, a lot of our, our early work, um, probably the first five years, was establishing a, a set of regulatory programs that we aren't we aren't seeing full benefit of yet. Um, that said, it absolutely merits tracking and we, we do track it on a, a very comprehensive basis. The other piece we are still working through is how we appropriately credit uh, the, the pollution reduction value of different practices we're using. Some things are really easy. A wastewater plant, you can grab a sample at the, the discharge point and know exactly what you're getting. Um, it's a lot harder when it comes to a, a restored floodplain, and you know that the water spill out of the river during a flood, drop a lot of sediment and nutrients, um, but how you actually account for what would have ultimately made its way to Lake Champlain is a bit more challenging. Um, and so we have some ongoing research projects, um, met several of which with the uh, University of Vermont around what we call a functioning floodplain initiative, and then there's a wetland component to it too, trying to make sure we are fully valuing uh, natural resources restoration projects as part of our clean water work. And, and relatedly, the, the phosphorus funds, um, are, we, are we, you know, to, to address TMDLs, are we getting those out every year on time or do we, are we getting more, I mean, do we have more of a need or do we have any carry forward in that? So we are, on track at this point, we in 2017, uh, Treasurer Pierce performed, completed an analysis and estimated the, the total clean water needs in the state, um, acknowledged that the state isn't fully responsible for funding all of the clean water needs in the state, and um, I ended up making an estimate that the state needed to raise about $50 million a year um, to sort of meet our obligations. That was then what informed um, the conversation that ultimately led to six points of the rooms and meals tax and the unclaimed bottle deposits being dedicated to clean water. This year we're above, right? We have $62 million in, in state resources going into clean water. Um, 
but in general, we're, we're in that, that zone uh, consistent with the treasurer's recommendations. Um, there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainty. I mean, this is a, a complex ecosystem and uh, you know, we're talking about a watershed that's thousands of square miles. So uh, I don't know that we can say with any certainty that we have absolute, exactly what we need to, to get the full job done. Um, but we are uh, have created a, a set of framework and supported partners in a way that I think is able to fully deploy the resources we have available to us and sort of keep us on track in terms of the, the magnitude of the work we think needs to be done. Thank you. Great. Thank you for coming in this morning and on short notice. And you're welcome. Your busy days. Yes. Well, and I have a list of things to follow up on, and Eric will provide some additional information on the SRF. Great. I offer a question about CF, but not specifically CF, but generally PFAS contamination. So the IIJA funds include both on the water side and drinking water side. Companies that are specifically targeted to deal with emerging contaminants are right now primary mass marketing. So on the drinking water side, seven and a half million per year for the five-year run of IIJA is targeted at that public water system for contamination. Uh, on the clean water side, it's a much smaller amount. Um, probably it is initially be used for funding. Uh, the first year is about a half a million, and then the succeeding four years it bumps up to about a million. And so those funds, they're all federal. There's actually no match required to those particular funds. Um, and um, the, all of those funds actually have to go out at full forgiveness. So essentially, they're the operating grant. Program and structure funds out as long as one last question, I think. And we have a 10 o'clock. Um, uh, we are testing a lot of schools right now for PCBs. Do we have um, a, like a plan as to? I know we're talking in education and elsewhere in terms of construction aid. Do we have a I know we have a plan because uh, Commissioner Bieland mentioned it, but uh, I'm just worried that we're going to have many schools that have um, elevated PCB uh, levels that are not um, something our towns across the board can address. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. So uh, we have money in the ECF to fully cover the cost of this initial testing um, that's underway. And more worried about what we Right. Find. There's also a, the General Assembly last year reserved $32.5 million in the education fund to support um, mitigation and ultimately remediation of PCBs. Uh, we did submit a funding proposal to the education committees, and I believe it may have come to the environmental committees as well. Um, back in the beginning of January for how we would propose to use that funding. Um, to date, we've completed testing in somewhere between 25 and 30 schools, um, and I think have nine where we have had exceedances of the either the immediate action level or the school action level. Um, so it's a fairly high hit rate. Um, we ultimately know we need to test about 320 schools. Um, so if that keeps up, uh, we would expect to have 80 or so schools that might require remediation. That said, we did a risk-based prioritization for how we're sampling them. So we are going to the highest risk schools first based on the age of construction and the age of the students. So I'm hopeful it'll taper over time, um, but we don't know. Uh, Vermont is the first state in the country to take this approach. Um, and comprehensively test schools, so we we don't really have rules of thumb um, that we could point to and look to other where in other places. Um, I think you're asking good questions, and the the fact of the matter is we 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 don't know right now. I think the levels um, or the extent of the contamination we are seeing in most schools at this point is not uh, extensive. It tends to be in a handful of of spaces, which um, 
gives us a better feeling about the match between those existing reserve funds and the, the need. But I, I think it is something that we're going to need to continue to pay attention to and talk about as we move through this work. Thank you. If you don't mind adding to your list to send that. Um, the PCB funding yeah. report? Yeah, sure. Thanks. <coughs> Great. Um, <clears throat> Secretary Moore, did you, you need it to be finished by 10? Uh, I, I actually think I have till 1030. Okay, great. So, and how much time do we need for Eric? I don't, Eric wasn't going right. to make oh, a specific see. presentation, but Holding. this is my phone a friend, <laughs> right, well, in case there were questions about the SRF. So we do have some more questions, Representative Morris. Mine's a short one. It's just a comment. Uh, basically, it's not really even, a, maybe it could be. Um, there's been a lot of conversations about uh, the Clean Water Fund, the uh, PFAS involvement and the identification and the efforts we're taking there. Uh, PCBs in schools has been identified as, uh, as an issue. I know funding is at a limitation, but I do not want to lose sight of our brownfield contamination. I come from a community that has a river that runs right through the middle of it, and brownfields are inundated along that. And uh, we, I, I just, just as a comment, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have existing programs that uh, also need financing. Right. Uh, the governor's FY24 budget does include two and a half million dollars to the um, proposal for the Agency of Natural Resources to related to the brownfields program and specifically uh, to expand our assessment work, which is uh, a necessary first step to readying these projects to being successful and competing for funds from EPA for the actual cleanup of the sites. Um, and then the governor's budget also, I believe, includes another $8 million uh, to go to ACCD, which helps with the redevelopment of those properties once they're fully remedied. So it, that remains an area of focus for us. Um, and frankly, an area where there's been some really exciting work done uh, over the last several years as a result of, of one-time money and federal opportunities. Thank you. Further questions on this budget for Secretary Moore? Um, do you think we'll be able to invite some of the other folks that Secretary mentioned? We'll give it a try tomorrow. Yes. Thank you again for joining us. You're you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, members, let's take a five minutes break. And then we have two more witnesses on the budget. And we have Michael O'Grady. So I've been a break. 